Um, you know, we hear a lot of, in the press about British um, citizens uh, involved in ISIS, and that's true. And we know there's, there's London boys involved in beheadings, etc., etc., and I don't think it's an exaggeration at all. But one thing I will point out to you, if you don't mind, is that people don't realise the amount of Brits that are actually fighting ISIS. I can tell you, for example, that here, just here where we are, I'm British. I'm Kurdish, absolutely, through and through PUK. But I'm British. I'm a subject of Her Majesty and proud to be so. The gentleman in charge of one of our major intelligence services is British. The commander of our elite special forces, the counter-terrorism group, is British. Our deputy prime minister, who's leading the fight politically, is also British. We have so many British and American Kurds here fighting against ISIS. And I think sometimes that's lost. It's important for you to know that. And what do you say to Britain about the threat if they don't, if we don't face up to it here? What happens? Do they get past you? Well, what, what I've got to say is that we'll fight our fight here and we'll fight to the best of our ability. And you've seen my guys, we'll fight to the death. And we fight for us, we fight for Kurdistan, we fight for the PUK. But a lot of us here, we have friends in the West, we're half British, we're half American, and we fight for you also. Whether you want it or not, we fight for you. When the Iraqis burnt our houses, the Iraqis burnt our schools. You gave us a place to live, you educated us. So it's our duty to fight for you. And we do that anyway. But I have frustrations. I really do. I have frustrations. Well, I'll come to those. You mentioned over there about them getting past you. I mean, do you see yourselves as an absolute front line in this? Oh, absolutely. This is the front line on the war on terrorism. It's right here. You've seen it. You've seen what's happening here. This is the front line. If they get past us, it's going to be very difficult. In fact, I would go as far as to say, you mark my words, if they get past us, they'll come for you. And will that be in small attacks or spectaculars? Or do you think they're planning something big? I think this movement's unlike anything we've seen before. I think it's growing at a rate that is unprecedented. I think their ability here in the country is frankly astounding. What they've been able to achieve, the um, amount of discipline, the amount of funding they seem to have, definitely the weapons and the quality of weapons. So they're obviously a well-funded, well-organized organization. And it's not going to be difficult to work in Europe, to work in the United States, definitely to work in the UK, and to conduct attacks, whether it be singular attacks here and there, whether it be explosions. I just think it's really possible. I'm, I'm sure it's coming. They need to be stopped here. They need to be stopped now. And to stop them, you need more arms? You know, to stop them, we need help. I don't want troops on the ground. This is something I want to make clear. At least the Kurds, from the Kurdish perspective, we don't want troops on the ground. We've had more than enough British and American deaths in this country. It's time for Iraq, it's time for Kurdistan, for the Kurds to stand on their own two feet and fight for their rights. But you can help us do this. We need weapons, we need arms, we need training. Uh, we can work together with intelligence, etc, etc. The, the problem we have is we don't have these things and we're not able to buy them. So at least help us, allow us to buy these weapons and look after our men or supply us with these weapons. And it, the reason that you're not is because of this, this, the concept that you would actually attempt to forcibly leave Iraq proper. But would it be a complicated thing to, to change the rules that allow, to allow you to buy weapons? Would it be difficult for the United States, difficult for Baghdad, difficult to London? Is it difficult for everyone or not? I don't think it's difficult at all. I mean, there is this misguided opinion that the Kurds, given the first opportunity, would declare independence. Um, you know, politically, it's just not sound for us to do that now. Does every Kurd want to be independent? Ab absolutely. But you have to do it in a way that is acceptable, in a way that it doesn't cause us problems. We're basically landlocked. We need to get on with everybody around us. And we've got a population to feed, to educate now. And this needs to be done first. There's no hurry for this independence thing. It will come in time naturally. And uh, you say, you, you know, you have a population, you have to feed them, and ultimately you have to protect them. Is that posing difficulties for you to protect the people? It depends on the region. Um, the threat is, is 
is, is manifold. There's, we, have a, we have a military front with these people. And we have areas where we share, um, we, we share regions with, with Arabs, with Sunnis, with Shiites. And it's these areas we're concerned about things happening in. Maybe not direct attacks on cities, but things within cities to bring down the morale of the population. And that's, yes, so Jalula is a very cl clear example of that. It's, it's Jalula is a very clear example. So, explain it. so, so ethnically, it's, it, it's a Kurdish town, but it's got a huge Arab population. It's got a huge Arab population. It's got some areas that the tribes in those areas were historically very Ba'athist. They were um, special security services. They were special military units, uh, special forces, etc., etc. A lot of intelligence families and stuff like that. And it's these areas that we have problems with in Jalola. And are those people, the Ba'athists, etc., we, we heard a lot of when they first arrived, ISIS. Is that still the case, that they are on board with them, that it's an opportunity for them, they were angry with the Iraqi yes. army? Yes and no. A lot of it comes down to their issues with the Iraqi government and how things have been handled from their perspective. I'm not a politician, it's not my place to say who's right or who's wrong, but how they feel is that they have been downtrodden by the Iraqi government. And their position is that the ISIS at the moment offer them the best chance to progress. Um, it's our job as Kurds, as being closest to them, to explain to them that no, this is not your best chance. Your best chance to go forward is part of a democratic, federative Iraq, where all the different ethnicities and religions can work together and move forward hand in hand. Uh, teaming up with these, frankly, savages is not the way to go forward. And the final question. You know, the makeup of ISIS is strange, isn't it? It is well organised, has come out. But I can't remember a bunch that are so completely, on the face of it, nuts. What happened? I, it's an interesting question. I agree with you, it's almost like super terrorism. It's an advance in the aggression. Um, I remember here with uh, Ansar al-Islam, with, with uh, Jund al-Islam, etc., etc., for example, it was very difficult to get one person to behead somebody. Now they seem to be falling over themselves to do these acts of butchery. It definitely is a different kind of terrorism. It's a much more aggressive, more merciless, brutal system. And I, I say again, this is, this is the front on the war on terrorism. And if we don't stop this here, they will come for the West. They'll come for England, they'll come for Europe, they'll come for the United States. They need to be stopped, and they need to be stopped decisively.